Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Donald. And you're in mixed company. Welcome to In Mixed Company, a podcast that discusses mixed race identity and discussing the politics of race respectfully and comfortably in mixed racial company. So on the podcast today is emboldening racists and dog whistle politics. How? Why? Oh, well, there are a lot of reasons, unfortunately. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll probably talk about what dog whistle politics are because I think you hear that term a lot but a lot of people don't really know what that means yeah and I mean I think I think the other thing too is that there's a lot of examples that come up every day um yeah. and especially it's, in the news around oh, it's, here yeah. it's all almost um focused on on some aspect of 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 that well the reason why we're doing this is that news story that happened in our city right with the guy in the you, van and the Walmart parking lot. Yeah. Usually Do you want to tell that story or should I? You can go for it. Tell them what okay. happened. So basically, this is kind of horrible in, in every which way, but basically this, um, uh, I think it was in a, a Muslim family was in a... They were brown. I don't know whether what their they were, race was. They fair just enough. were not white people. Okay. So so persons of color, a family, were in the Walmart parking, parking lot uh, down, the, down the road a little ways. And um, a white man hit one of them with his truck or van and basically screamed at them uh, all sorts of racial invective, basically was proudly proclaiming himself to be extremely racist and that he wanted to kill their children first um, and then, by implication, them later. So... He lost it. Yeah, it was. And I mean, that's that's just one example. And you actually see a lot of sort of um, parallels between that and a lot of other things that we're seeing. Yeah. You know, if I can find um, a video of the story with the video that was shown in the news, yeah. then I'll link it on the blog, which is imcpodcast.blogspot.com yep. so that you can have a look. And I think I think that might also be part of the reason why, you know, we are hearing more about that is the fact that technology has sort of closed that gap because now people have cell phones and they're videotaping all of these things happening. Yeah, so I guess there's like um, proof yeah. that it's happening. But it leads to the bigger question, right? Like, do people feel more like emboldened to portray like this racist behavior, right? Like, why... Do we see so many stories of this in the news today? And I mean, I've had my run-ins. Um, yeah. And it's sort of, it's been a little more frequently than it had in the past. Well, I mean, you've you've had this year even what? How many? Six. So that's a lot. Yeah, I average about one a month. Yeah, that's pretty rough. So, so comparatively, but I remember in the past, like it was just so far, few and far between, like that when it happened, I was just like, "What it is was, happening?" It was, but now it just happens so frequently that I don't really think about it. You're a little more desensitized. Yeah, like I'm mad for a little bit. Yeah, but I don't like stew in it like I used to because <laughs> I'm like it's gonna happen again. So yeah, but I mean. That, that's that's not to say that it's appropriate or acceptable. It's just that, you know, you've you've gotten to a point now. I don't where think anybody's saying it's appropriate or acceptable. I hope not. Um, no, I just mean like, you know, as you become more used to something, sometimes you know, depending on what side of it you're on, that can be a bad thing. Well, I think, I think I also. I'm, I treat it differently. Like I, I'm very careful about where I go. Yeah. I get nervous in certain types of groupings, and I don't like to go out alone at night. And I mean, part of that's just being a woman. But um, I do get nervous, and I do think twice about doing certain things. Yeah. I mean, which isn't a great way to live. It's more like a self protection <laughs> mechanism. But I mean, sometimes. Sometimes the situation is going to happen, like it's going to occur that 
I can't not do it. Like, I do have to go grocery shopping, and I'm addicted to coffee, so I'm going to have to go get those. Um, yeah, you, no one no one ever wants to see you without your coffee. No, 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 no. no. So um, we're going to talk about some theories and why we think people uh, feel emboldened to lash out and act violently towards people of, of different races. Um, we're also going to talk about dog whistle politics because I think that that is one of the theories that I have about why people feel that it's more acceptable, I guess, to say some pretty horrific racist things. Um, I don't know if we'll come to a conclusion today. Yeah, this is more of a, I mean, like all of it, it's, it's evolving over time. Yeah. And I mean, if we are living in a period of backlash right now, you know, um, we're going to be seeing that for a while. And then eventually there will be an answer. People get sick of this type of stuff and it, it, we move forward. Uh, maybe not as much as we would like, but at least a little bit. So, you know, when you look at it over time, um, unfortunately, what you see is maybe a, a pattern where this has started, you know, this started going upwards when Obama was in, and now he's out and Trump is in. Mm. I mean, that's the, you know, that's that's on everyone's sort of mind. Even even if we're not even in that country, that's still, like, part of our awareness. I, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of facile to blame Trump. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, he's one guy, I don't know. I'm I'm talking more about. And I mean, about, he has some problematic ideals, I think, but I, not not enough that somebody's going to call me a name at a coffee shop, right? Like he had said that he didn't like when people were doing that. But on the other hand, he also said that during Charlottesville, there were fine people on both sides. So I'm not really sure how to take his sort of role in this. But, um, so we do have some data. <laughs> yes. Um, so I had been doing some research and I had found um, a pretty good article from Reuters um, just last year by John Whitesides um, talking about how he thinks, and this is in the American context, of course, um, that Americans say that race relations are deteriorating um, from what they were uh, just two years ago. And what they had is they did a Reuters um, Ipsos poll, poll, which are pretty good. And the the sample was about 2,800 people. And they thought um, 36% of those 2,800 people gave race relations the worst rating possible in the poll, um, saying that it was an imminent threat in America. And this is uh, higher from 29% of the same poll. Um, two years ago, uh, which is significant. Um, Three people had also noted that they had seen a greater rise in people's willingness to express racial hostility, and I think that's the point of what we're making here today, is that people in the past, they've always had whatever beliefs they've had, but they're more willing to shout it out now instead of, you know, just, I don't know, yelling it into a pillow or whatever they did before. B biting it down and <laughs> burying it deep. <laughs> Day drinking. I don't know what they did before. <laughs> um, but now they're just willing to sort of take that out on people. Um, and <laughs> it's it's funny because they always bring sort of their two-party politics into it. Um, so the Democrats that were surveyed were more negative about perceived threats than Republicans. However... I have a theory as to why that is. Can you guess why? Is it because most Republicans are white? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know why that point was brought up, but it, it did make me laugh. I was like, well, no doubt. <laughs> um, yeah, amazing what being white and rich can do to you. Yeah. And there have been two really good sort of think tanks. There's the Southern Poly uh, Southern. Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League in the United States, and they have actually been collecting statistics um, about uh, violent and, you know, and 
like verbally violent and physically violent um, incidents that are happening with people of color. And so they have a pretty good um, database of what's going on there. So you should check out their website if you're interested yeah. in that. Well, and they reported, I mean, I think they reported a sharp uptick in the incidents as well. Yeah. And so, I mean, and as I had alluded to before, Trump had said after his election that, you know, he didn't like that people were making these bigotry acts in his name. He wanted people to stop it. So he had said that, which is why, I mean, and he has said a lot of things. But he has also, he had also commented on that. So that's why I think it's kind of easy to blame him. But I don't think that's the whole story. I think he's more like the great enabler. Yeah, maybe. Um, not that he is commanding people or, you know, like, go out and do this. I yeah. don't think that's the case. I mean, I'm not a Trump supporter. No. Um, I, I... But I think that... I mean, and in Canada, we call it the quote-unquote Trump effect, which I don't think is fair. Mm. Um, because I think that, if anything, it is more of a backlash of the progress that had been made with um, with politics in the previous, right? Like Obama, who, who's fairly progressive. Um, he was the president. He also identifies as a black man. He's biracial. <laughs> Um, and so I thought, so I think people thought that we were in the sort of post-racial era because a black guy could be president. But I think that if anything, this is not Trump's fault. I think that this is sort of what happened after that progressive sort of stance, right? Like here in Canada, we elected, um, a very progressive, very young prime minister um but now here in ontario where we live we're sort of seeing a backlash against that because a really conservative fat white guy mm -hmm. just got in as premier who's the leader of it's kind of like the state governor right and so i see that as a backlash against and he's Trudeau. also he's also a very sort of like shoots from the hip um you know likes his propaganda he, he, he has yeah. a very he has a very sort of I won't say like it, he's not using the same playbook because you know the political realities are going to be different mm -hmm. but he does use a lot of that sort of fast movement um, antagonizing the media and, yeah. and, and, and not treating sort of like not treating uh, reporters uh, with respect or, or even giving them really access yeah. um, to ask questions directly and just just cutting every sort of social justice influenced like action that's happened like just in the summer i mean he just came in yeah he's only been June, in for a month and stopped our first nations curriculum from being written um wants to go back in time with our sex ed curriculum um so that it doesn't include you know glbtq people and yeah. has cut all the funding for us to renovate our old schools and fixed income's gone yeah the basic fixed income pilot pilot project which allowed people sort of to have uh, enough money to really build their lives again um is over yeah uh and and that's just in one month it's been a bit of a clean long energy and, and so i see it more of a sort of like a backlash i think that that's i think that's one of my sort of theories is that it's not just this guy's fault it's what happens when a culture pushes forward right and then there's a group of people who liked the way it was and they want to push it back but they weren't in the experience of the bad parts of the way it was do you know what i mean yeah and so that's where i think we're going right they're like well it was so great when i didn't have to pay this many taxes and uh, this and this and this. I didn't and I have to like, watch what I had to say. Yeah, and so, but I'm just like, yeah, but you weren't on the other side of that where yeah. your culture was completely ignored yeah. or, you know, you couldn't decide, you had to decide between food and a winter coat. You know what I mean? And so I think that's part, that's one of my theories as why people feel more sort of emboldened. It's the backlash sort of idea. And there's a great book on backlash. It's called Backlash. Um, by Susan Faludi, and it's from the 80s, 
and I've bought it four times because I lend it out to people and forget. So if uh, you borrowed my book, can I have it back? No. Well, the money, because you've already bought it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a good, it's a great text about sort of the ebb and flow of progress, right? So, anyways, what do you think? I know that you wanted to talk about dog whistling, because this yeah, is so, sort of your wheelhouse, so let's go with it. All right, it's dog whistling. So, and going back to sort of our, um, you know, our previous episode where we, we put in uh, focus the definitions that we're using. When we're talking about dog whistling, what we're meaning by that is, uh, especially in politics, is political messaging that employs or uses coded language that appears to mean one thing to the general population, but has an additional, different, or more specific uh, resonance or meaning for a targeted subgroup. So in other words, um, usually, you know, uh, when you listen to a speech from a far right candidate or, you know, even a, even a far left candidate, they will use examples. Um, well, they will use like terms that don't mean, don't mean what they, well, what you might think they may, they yeah. mean, right? So like if somebody's talking about stopping immigration. Yeah. It, there, it's a little more coded than that. It's it's not stopping European immigrants. Yeah, like it, yeah. Basically. Um, and so some examples that I have heard of is I've heard of um, this is a big one for reporters um, when if you're on a, a when a site like where you like a social media site where you make like comments and stuff like that. Yeah. When referring to certain reporters who are Jewish, um, putting triple brackets yeah. around their ne- their names and um, that's the Southern Poverty Law Center calls that um, the echo brackets. Yeah. And that's to outline that this person is Jewish, right? And so if you were to see three brackets, I'd just be like, that guy loves brackets. Yeah. But that's not really the case, right? And that's sort of an example of a dog whistle because other people who are sort of in the know will know what that means. Same, same thing with things like the word snowflake. <laughs> or um, you know, lib or there's a word that I don't really like because it, it's it's a cognate between uh, liberal and a, a pejorative for a person with a mental disability. Uh, yeah, I don't really like to say that, but yeah. um, you know, there are there are plenty of examples out there. I mean, if you just wanted to, you know, do a simple search of mm-hmm. of, of words, Google will well, it'll it'll make you want to bleach your eyeballs probably. Mm-hmm. Well, and like the whole birther movement, that's yeah, another dog whistle, right? Because exactly. It's a conspiracy theory. Oh, Alex it's, Jones. It's not really a conspiracy. It was like, it means something else. They're like, let's use birth certificate. Well, what are you really saying? Because yeah. he did show a birth certificate eventually. Yeah. And that wasn't enough, right? Like, so why is that still something that people can call on? Yeah. No matter what, no matter what happened there, people still believe that it was all a lie, Mm -hmm. you know, that no matter what he, and by he, we mean Obama, um, no matter what Obama showed, it was all faked. And he was still a, you know, un-American, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like they just went down that road, that that rabbit hole as far as they could go. Yeah. Um, So... Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of examples of it, and this is something interesting that 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 came up while I was sort of doing, you know, just some background research on the on the podcast about um, the idea of a Southern Republican strategy. So um, I didn't know this, and this is actually something that that kind of shocked me, really. Uh, but from back in the day when Nixon was running, all the way up to mm-hmm. Bush. And uh, all the way up to Bush and Trump, um, there the the Republican strategy was was basically encompass or it encompassed a view that the real problem with politics were black people, um, and the key to winning the presidency in the United States and winning at politics in general was to devise a system that recognized this uh, fact that black people were a problem while not appearing to. And the change that's happened recently is that's gone from sort of a southern strategy to a nationalized strategy. Yeah, I can see that. Like, 
nationalized strategy like gerrymandering or what? Well, that's part of it, gerrymandering. Um, also, <laughs> voter ID laws. <laughs> that too. Um, restrictive. Tr- Trump wants a voter ID card. Yeah. You know, buy. like you use for buying groceries, he yeah, said. <laughs> I know. I don't think he's ever. I don't think he's ever bought groceries. Um, but yeah, he wants um, a voter ID card, which I think was a thing. Uh, if you know if that was a thing, let me know because I. I'm yeah, not sure. It's every state has their own rules, I think. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, is the way the way um, politicians talk mm-hmm. was very specific in the South compared to elsewhere in in the country home sweet home and now they all use the same language you'll find the republican party using the same language uh against persons of color immigration uh voting abuses you know well yeah. alleged voting abuses because there's no mm-hmm. actual proof anybody's actually done that other than you know a few of their own supporters so yeah. that's kind of weird um, yeah. But it's it's these it's these sort of intangible threats to the quote unquote American way of life or the, you know the perceived threats, right? Yeah. Because, like in the states, blacks are Americans. Yeah. Right. Like they were, a majority of them are descended from slaves. Like my family is, we're descended from slaves. So if you were to say, "Hey, where's your family from?" I'm like, "I don't know, America. <laughs> we were slaves," uh, and shut down that whole conversation, I guess. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody was like uncomfortable silence. Oh, so oh god. I mean, yeah, it, it so the dog whistling at the my thing is about immigration. We got to limit immigration. We got to build the wall. Well, the wall doesn't go around the whole country, so it's pretty clear what kind of immigration. Yeah. Um they they don't want brown people <laughs> yeah, coming from the south, right? Well, for, yeah, for example, they're not building that wall between Canada and the United States. They're building the wall oh, at Mexico. Yeah, I know. And, I mean, what's, what's, what's interesting or funny is that Canada is actually approaching, um, at least in its urban centers now, mm-hmm. um, majority uh, multiracial um, or, or um, non-white. Mm-hmm. And that's, like... What's I did read an article about that, probably in the Sun or something stupid. It but, was a while ago. Uh, um, how it'll be more than half minorities, which I found grammatically hilarious. But also offensive. But really offensive, because I don't like the term minority, because it it's not a numeric minority, obviously, as stated in that title. Yeah. More than half minorities, like... And also the tone of that article yeah, so was maybe, alarmist. No, hold on, I want to go. So maybe don't use the term minority anymore. Yeah. yeah, let's. Yeah, let's get rid of that. I mm-hmm. don't like that one. That's it. Don't use that one. Deal. Okay. <laughs> um. But yeah, like it was just a panic piece. But I'd seen that before too. Like like ten years ago, I had seen an article like that. Yeah, and you've also seen those articles recently too. Yeah. And it's 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 sort of it's repeated. We were watching a what was it? It was a speech with a, a guy who's locally running for mayor. <laughs> Last name Paul Fromm. Fromm, and he was he, he had was, run for mayor in a lot of places. Yeah, he's he sucks. he's also buds with David Duke. That should tell you enough about him. Um, but he he raises those same points Th- that alarm that oh my god we're gonna lose what makes us us. No. You know, and he's talking about white, westernized European culture, whatever. I don't Which even... you won't lose. Well, right? that's like, the fallacy. I'm half, I'm half Hungarian, and I throw that into every conversation I can. Goodness help you if you're Hungarian, because I'm coming at you with the five words I know. Which are usually funny. Or is that Portuguese? Oh, I'm not Portuguese, but I could play one on TV. No, I know you, and you can, you, but you, you say things. <laughs> An in angry Portu- Portuguese person. Yeah, but you also say things in Portuguese that, that make people. They don't make any sense. They make con- everybody laugh. It's yeah. a lot of fun. That's why I learn languages. But, anyways, back to my five words in Hungarian. <laughs> my mom's Hungarian, and she, I know three foods. Thank you. And, uh,. A very respectful way of saying hello. Mm. 
So if you're Hungarian out there and you want to know my five words, send me a message. Hit us up. All right. Um, so the question is, again, does dog whistling help embolden people to say racist things? Um, yes, because I think it shows them that, hey, hey, buddy, hey, racist buddy, you're not alone. Yeah. I got you. Well, they probably wouldn't say it like that, but, you know, I think that um, it's a way of sort of creating a community, a secret community for people that have sort of thoughts that are racist in scope. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the idea of uh, social assistance or Medicare or up here, for example, um, indigenous peoples and you know any program or or sort of social justice effort that assists with those things and then you're going to hit um you know there's a wall uh for the conservative side oh my goodness did you see that story this woman's car got spray painted she didn't know who it was Mm. and she like took to social media and was like uttering like she was writing death threats how she wanted to go and have a quote-unquote purge on the reservation and like oh I'll kill all the quote unquote Indians it was bizarre I did not see that yeah so I mean with I feel with the indigenous um, population in Canada that it's pretty bad like it's like they're blamed for everything everything and they're like it's just yeah like to the point of death threats mm-hmm. to the point of somebody sat and typed yeah and read it again and then hit enter yeah these death threats for a crime that she had no idea who did yeah and chances are it was somebody i mean you know it was probably who cares who it was you can't just assume no it was probably someone she knew (laughs) who doesn't like her i would have done it (laughs) yeah so i mean it doesn't you know but because most of the time you know that that type of stuff isn't random yeah um but it just it, it it kills me because the same issues always hit you know, when you're going to mm-hmm. find people who want things to stay the same, who yeah. want, who sorry, want things to stay the same. Yeah. You know, it's always going to be a conversation about taxes are too high, social assistance is too high, yeah. Medicare is is a waste, or yeah. You know, I mean, and we talk about social assistance and poverty and stuff like that because a large, like a, a disproportionate amount, I should say of people who do live in poverty or who do use social assistance are women or not women are people of color and women and and people with disabilities and so i mean that it's already sort of a vulnerable population yeah um i also think that there are some so for why people feel emboldened to shout racist things is that i think there's more strategies available to people to say things that are racist so like um like deflecting yeah so you called it what did you call it whataboutism whataboutism well when what pe- is what is whataboutism so let's say you bring attention to a significant issue like oh i don't know police brutality against people of color okay and instantaneously uh you know um the commentators get on the networks and start saying so this is happening but what about this oh. and then it's like well what about you know this one specific instance where you know this this cop was you know attacked by a person of color or something like that yeah what about you know what about the fact that we don't rep- or respect our police officers anymore yeah. and blah 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 and so it 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 changes the focus of the conversation away from the event or the issue that people are trying to bring into focus and deal with Mm -hmm. and instead it muddies the waters it gets people away from that and it basically it just it just totally moves it's kind of like taking over a conversation so for example like if you have black lives matter and somebody says all lives matter does that what about ism or is that dog whistling it's both because at first it starts what about all lives yeah. Who said it was only... And then the chant of all lives matter is... The dog whistle. Yeah, is a dog whistle to other people who would think that, right? Because when you're saying black lives matter, 
nobody's saying that the other lives don't matter. No. <laughs> right? Like, that's not a thing. You're reading into it something that's not there, right? Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. So I think that our thing is, like, there are strategies for deflection of issues. So, like, whataboutism. Yeah. There's dog whistling, which helps bring people together. <laughs> Through well, coded language. Well, and there's also like internet communities now too, where people can yeah. share their ideas and forums that are sort of members only. Yeah, it's not so hard to find people of like. Yeah, like mindedness, right? Yes. You can just. It's easier to get a message out. Yeah. Um, and it's easier to, it's easier to connect. And the other thing too is that people. Well, and people are, can encourage you, right? Like, oh, you're totally. Yeah. You know what you should do? Like. Yeah. Yeah. So so there's that, and also I mean, people are. Like it's it's weird to say this because people are getting smarter. Mm-hmm. Um, the the availability the re- the ready availability of information mm-hmm. helps people learn more about how to do things more effectively. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's not just anti racists who are learning. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, others are learning as well, and so everyone everyone is sort of in in ingesting information and 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 turning that into something they can use. So. People are getting more clever about how they talk. They're getting more um, subversive in their language. They're not being so overt. I mean, you know. And there's ways for you to find out about these coded messages, right? Yeah. Like, um, I know I plug them a lot, but the SPLC, um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, is um, a great resource for looking up things. If you see symbols that you're like, what does that mean? You can look up. They have a whole database of hate symbols. Um which I suggest that people do because um, it's always good to be informed of certain things. Um, but we have ways of finding out sort of information, right? And knowing which boards to stay or clear of and strategies on how to deal with, you know, trolls online and stuff like that. Yeah, well, the, and then, you know, on the other side of that, you also have the trolls sharing you know, sharing notes on things like 4chan and stuff like that. Like, yeah. hey guys, let's start this, and then it becomes a viral, yeah, sensation in the wrong way. Yeah. Um, but that's like that's sort of the negative aspect of things. Yeah. I think there's also a positive aspect too, and I think that that's really, I mean, not not of the dog whistling stuff, but rather mm-hmm. of people's reaction to it. Yeah. I think that when something happens, people are like, "What? That's awful!" <laughs> right? And yeah. so. Um, the reaction um, to these stories and people documenting them, right, so that they could be spread, um, like, through the news. I yeah. think that that's really important. Yeah, so keep filming stuff. <laughs> and then the news is really serious about reporting them, right? Like, and like they're not like, hey, look at this. That was all right. Like, they don't yeah. report it in that style. They're like... Well, and how long do you think it was ago when people you know would would report these things to the media but the media didn't really take any notice or didn't didn't put them on prime time you know yeah unless they were really really bad Mm -hmm. whereas now it's every day and things that become viral like the permit patties and yeah barbecue becky and what was the other guy that skeezy lawyer guy i don't know (laughs) do you remember skeezy lawyer in new york he was like, oh, oh just yes. Big English. <laughs> yeah, that, that was awful. And then they're not even talking to you. What do you care? So he got let go from his law firm. Oh. Well, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, um, I think that we're also policing that too, right? Um, now, this is another podcast. Do we deserve to destroy people's lives <laughs> for them making those mistakes? I don't know. But there should be consequences. But um, well, I think I think as long as the legal consequences make sense, you yeah. don't need the social consequences. Yeah. The question is: is are the legal consequences effective? Yeah, and I think we'll have to explore that another time. Another time. So, um, thanks for the discussion today, Don. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, I don't think we solved anything, but I think we brought a couple of theories to the forefront. If you and me could somehow solve racism, oh. good lord, we should bottle that. <laughs> oh, well, uh, maybe that, I'd be all about the Benjamins. I was so happy there for a second. 
Um, <gasps> uh, <sighs> and just because the podcast is over doesn't mean that the conversation has to stop. We'd love to hear your comments on today's um, discussion, your reflections, if you have any questions. You can visit us at our blog at imcpodcast.blogspot.com, or you can tweet to us at imcpodcast. Uh, if you're a Facebook user, we have a page there, too, at facebook.com slash imcpodcast. Um, our email address is inmixedcopodcast at gmail.com if you want to get in touch with us that way. Our theme music is the song Righteous Fight by Angara. Thanks for listening. See you next Sunday. Bye.